okay? It should be noted that the hard times leads to strong men, leads to et cetera, et cetera, stuff is generally attributed to, or at least associated with, Julius Evola. We've talked about this guy on stream before. Vosh is a popular left-wing debater and streamer. A man who I'm sure needs no introduction. If you're in online politics, you know of Vosh. In my experience of him, and this is not only my opinion, he often talks on subjects that he knows nothing about, and will even admit beforehand or after that he knows nothing about the subject that he's talking about, as if admitting ignorance absolves you of the lies that you spread. And Vosh is a liar, not simply ignorant. An ignorant man wouldn't proclaim to know everything about a subject, then, well, proceed to say the complete opposite of the subject. And that brings us to the topic of my video, Vosh and Julie Sevola. It is astonishing how so many lies and misinformation can be said in so little of time. The clips that he talks about Evola only account for maybe three minutes, and well, it's a wild ride. Vosh is wild. Vosh lies with the typical left-wing imagery of Julius Evola, the Wikipedia talking points. He even literally brings up Wikipedia, and before you crucify me, I know Wikipedia can be a good source sometimes, but it often gives you so little, especially when trying to condense the ideas of a man whose work spans decades. Julius Evola is undoubtedly a controversial thinker with a controversial history, yet Vosh knows nothing about him. I could talk about all of his beliefs. So first off, if I were to ask you if Wikipedia is a good source on the ideas of Hegel, Immanuel Kant, Marx, or well, any other writer or philosopher, you might respond that it kind of is. You might say that it gives a basic summary, a virtual account, even simply someone's interpretation of the work, or someone's interpretation of someone's interpretation of the work. That would be fairly uncontroversial. Wikipedia can give you the impression of an author that may be true in a virtual sense, but falls apart or falls short when actually reading the author's work yourself. It should be seen, if anything, a rough summary of somebody's life that may include their reputation and an introduction to their thought, or at least someone's description of their thought. Yet when it comes to Julius Evola, we're told to believe that his Wikipedia article is all there is to know about him and his ideas. Why actually read his works or his account of his works when you can read somebody else's account of somebody else's account of his work. And when learning about Julius Evola myself, I was shocked when I read his Wikipedia article for the first time. This man seemed horrifying. Even just reading his Wikipedia article made me feel a sense of dread, as if I had uncovered some sort of demonic force that would destroy me. How could this man justify the occult? Or ghosts? How could he say that sex magic is real, that women should be completely dominated and subjugated by men? And well, asking these questions poked my curiosity. I had to read his works and see how he argued these insane things. Myself and like you, when first hearing about Julius Evola and traditionalism, may have gotten the impression that Julius Evola was a far-right social conservative, a Ronald Reagan-like figure. Women can't vote and they're only good for making dinner and having kids. Men need to be bullies and entrepreneurs, church on Sunday is a must, and America is the best, most free nation in the world. And it would surprise you to learn that this is the opposite of Evola and traditionalism, yet it is clear that this is the impression that Walsh has of him. Sprinkle in some fascism, a cult mumbo jumbo, and spaghetti and meatballs, and Walsh would no doubt say that he describes Julius Evola. I could talk about all of his beliefs. And, well, let's be honest. Every modern leftist critique of Julius Evola boils down to his Wikipedia article and their preconceived notions about fascism, traditionalism, and the right wing, not his works or what he actually believed. I do not think that I can simply debunk a Wikipedia article, nor will that fall into the scope of this video, yet I can only show how Wikipedia itself may give an impression that is not the whole of reality. Take, for example, the first sentence. Julius Evola was an Italian philosopher, poet, and painter whose esoteric worldview featured anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and the occult. This is a strange opening to Julius Evola, though hard to call a lie. In fact, it pretty much is true. 
Julius Evola was a quote-unquote philosopher, a poet, a painter. He did have an esoteric worldview. He was undoubtedly anti-Semitic and had a relationship with the occult. Yet reading this, you may get the impression that Julius Evola simply was a man who spread anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and studied the occult. Yet his anti-Semitic conspiracy theories account for so little of his works. In fact, as far as I'm aware, the only true anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that Evola had a relationship with is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which Evola translated. So why should we not read Evola's own account of this decision and hear what he really had to say on the topic? Take for example these passages from the chapter Weapons of the Occult War in Men Among the Ruins. Regarding the authenticity of the Protocols, a rabid and complex debate has erupted, which can be dismissed, however, by Guanan's correct observation that a truly occult organization, no matter what its nature, never leaves behind written documents or protocols. Thus, in the most favorable hypothesis, the protocols could have been the work of someone who had contacts with some representatives of this alleged organization. And, according to the protocols, the leaders of the global plot are Jews. This is obviously an exaggeration. At this point, we may one even wonder whether a fanatical anti-Semitism, which always sees the Jew as a deus ex machina, is not unwittingly played into the hands of the enemy. And second, it is true that many Jews have been and still are among the promoters of modern disorder in its more radical and cultural expressions, whether political or social. After all, despite the fact that many Jews are among the apostles the main ideology, ideologies regarded by the protocols as instruments of global subversion, it is also evident that these ideas would have never been arisen if not triumphed without historical antecedents such as the Reformation, humanism, the naturalism and individualism of the Renaissance, and the philosophy of Descartes. As you may see, Julius Evola's perspective on the protocols is a lot more complex than him simply buying into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories akin to modern-day alt-writers or conspiracy nuts. He decided to take a more complex perspective on a subject that did not rely on its authenticity, but whether or not what he saw what was being said as having some sort of ample of truth. Yet the narrative given by Wikipedia gives a simple one-dimensional outlook. That is basically true, but is only basic. I could go on, but like I said, that would be outside the scope of this video. My point, however, is that Julius Evola is someone who no nuance is ever afforded, as if Vosh ever grants any nuance to right-wingers. We know that Vosh is not happy with his allegations regarding the subjects like the age of consent or his sexual harassment, and we know that he and his followers would beg us to give him some nuance on those topics. And I ask, why can't? We or Vosh do the same for Evola. Why is it that Vosh could say something like, Oh my god, wait, hold on, I'm sorry. So you guys know how recently I talked about that Joe Rogan Instagram post, and I talked about Julius Evola briefly, the, like, mega-Nazi? I actually saw some people on Twitter malding, saying that, like, I hadn't read his theory. Not to mention the fact that Evola would never consider his work theory like the tankies interested in obscure Marxist philosophy that Vosch desperately tries to conflate his detractors with, Vosch would argue, and I believe he has argued, that he had said some wild things, but that we should look at his work in a more wider and nuanced scope. And I will argue the same for Evola. And I talked about Julius Evola briefly, the, like, mega-Nazi. And yeah, he's a Nazi. He literally worked with the SS. He's like the mega-super-fascist, you know, like, He's, he's like, so, yeah, he thought Mussolini was too much of a liberal. He was, yeah, CEO of fascism. Fascism has undergone a process of what can be called mythologizing. In regard to it, the attitude taken by most people has an emotional and irrational character instead of a critical and intellectual one. Julius Evola, Fascism Viewed from the Right, Chapter 2. I don't need to be the first to say that the accusation of fascism, especially from leftists, especially from Vosh, holds little weight. This is a man who believes that George Bush and Judge Scalia are fascists. 
He believes that neoconservatives, Republicans, liberals, and even social democrats are all fascists or fascists in waiting. Hell, even those critical of Vosh call him a fascist. Though Vosh is one of the main people who will say that his accusation of fascism is completely justified. Julius Evola is a man who was and is repeatedly called a fascist. He was even put on trial for this. Vosh, of course, knows this. And I talked about Julius Evola briefly, the like mega Nazi. I actually saw some people on Twitter mauling, saying that like I hadn't read his theory and he wasn't actually like actually he's like not really a fascist and so on. And because I'm an idiot, I thought for a second, oh goodness, I hope I didn't get anything wrong. So I looked down the thread. He, he wasn't a fascist. When he was at that trial and he called himself a super fascist, that was like a meme, dude. He what, what he was saying was he was so fascist that he was more fascist than the fascist the court uh, prosecutor knew about. But that's not him being fascist. Like, like it was shit like that. And then I look and I saw like Roy Burr accounts and shit. I was like, oh, okay, I don't know why I even bothered reading through this shit, you know? It should be noted that Julius Evola was never found guilty of being a fascist. Leftists, however, don't care. The courts can be wrong, can't they? And of course, they can be, which is why we should instead look at Julius Evola's own defense and see how he defended himself. We can tell Vosh is lying about seeing this thread about Julius Evola. Nobody who defends Julius Evola from the super fascist line says that he was just joking or it was a meme. It's clear that Vosh just can't let go of the it was just a joke, bro. YouTube skeptic, not writer, he so nostalgically clings on to. Julius Evola was not joking. He was not memeing. It's as simple as a mistranslation, and a very obvious one. In Italian, super means above, not the ultimate cumulation of, or something in its extreme. It's strange how this is even taken into account in the Wikipedia article that Vosh has on stream and has supposedly read. I quote, Concerning this statement, historian Elisabetta Casino Wolf wrote that it is unclear whether this meant that Evola was placing himself above or beyond fascism. Obviously, when Vost then says that Evola said he was, a, was the super fascist and that people were saying he was joking was a lie. That or Vosh is so lazy he can't read the literal next sentence of something. So why is Julius Evola not a fascist? Evola makes it very clear that his ideas are not only not fascist, but are not his own original ideas in the sense that Evola is simply following a line of thought from Plato to Joseph de Maistre, people that obviously predated fascism. I quote, I reject the accusation of defending ideas proper to fascism because the expression proper to contained in Article 7 means specific to, means ideas that have not simply been present in fascism, but ideas that can be found only in fascism and not elsewhere. Now, in regard to myself, this is absolutely not the case. I have defended, and I still defend, fascist ideas not in as much as they are fascist, but in the, the measure that they revive ideas superior and anterior to fascism. As such, they belong to the heritage of the hierarchical, aristocratic, and traditional conception of the state. A conception having a universal character and maintained in Europe up to the French Revolution. In fact, the position that I have defended and continue to defend as an independent man because I have never been enrolled in any party, not the PNF, the PRF, or the MSI, to not be called fascist, but traditional and counter-revolutionary. Evola very obviously saw himself as following a line of reactionary thought that predated fascism. He says this multiple times in basically all his works, even the book he wrote critiquing fascism. Now I know what all my leftist detractors will say, why should I believe Julius Evola? He's a fascist. And fascists lie about what they believe, especially when called fascist. And I wholeheartedly reject this idea, not to mention that these claims that fascists always lie about their beliefs 
is really only supported by one 4chan thread, Evola was writing at a time where it was very popular to be a fascist. When not being a fascist could get you killed. There was no benefit to not being a fascist, yet he maintained an ideological distance to fascism. What would Evola have to gain by never being a fascist member? Do you think he saw into the future so he could use that as a defense? And concerning Evola, why would we not defend his ideas as being a true representation of what he believes? All we really know about Evola is what he believes. All his criticism is based on his beliefs. He should be the easiest person to know the true beliefs of. Evola, of all people, is someone who maintained his worldview throughout the whole of his life. In fact, the idea that Julius Evola would lie about his beliefs or distance himself from fascism in order to plead plausible deniability is hilarious. Evola, above anybody else, would stand by his convictions no matter any circumstance. And if we consider this logically, it just falls apart. This idea that right-wingers are Machiavellian liars, that disguise our true beliefs under false, more gentler ones, is simply a symptom of left-wing paranoia. If right-wingers truly wanted to lie about our beliefs, why would we not simply adopt left-wing views? And couldn't we say the, even say the opposite, that conservatives who talk about their beliefs are doing themselves a disservice? Why would such Machiavellian actors, such masterminded individuals, just not adopt what is most popular at the time instead of having such contentious views? In specific to Evola, he had to have had the most contentious views of anybody. Like I said, Evola would have no doubt called himself a fascist if he considered himself a fascist. In fact, he says, we should call ourselves fascist if we decide to do so in relation to what was positive in fascism, but not in relation to what was not positive in fascism. Now, my detractors may also argue that when they call Evola a fascist, that does not mean a literal fascist, but that his thought follows a characteristic of fascism or is fascism in its extreme. And again, I would refer you to what Evola said above. It's strange that we would argue that something is a characteristic of fascism and not simply a principle that exists on its own but is present in fascism, as well as many other philosophies. You see, leftists are under the illusion that fascism, more so than a concoction and mutation of political motivations and philosophies that existed at one point in time, is an eternal threat to Western civilization. I quote, The reality of today is that while one group considers fascism as a simple parenthesis, an aberration in our more recent history, others resemble people who have been born today and believe that nothing has existed before yesterday. Julius Evola, page 26, Fascism Viewed from the Right. Fascism is eternal, er, fascism if you will. That's right, we must address Umberto Eco. I'll be honest with you, I don't believe Umberto Eco ever read Evola, but I think his entire conception of er, fascism revolves around Evola. Take for example the quote, Add a cult of Celtic mythology and the Grail mysticism, completely alien to official fascism, and you have one of the most respected fascist gurus, Julius Evola. It's strange how Umberto Eco is so fixated on Evola's The Mystery of the Grail, he even references it a second time. The most influential theoretical sources of the theories of the new Italian rite, Julius Evola, merges the Holy Grail with the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, alchemy with the Holy Roman and Germanic Empire. Where does he do that, Echo? What on earth are you talking about? It's clear that Echo doesn't understand traditionalism or syncretism. He tries to conflate the two. Rene Guanan, who he also references, has a whole chapter where he bashes syncretism. I must go into Echo's first point to call the tradition even more because he attempts to discount something which he knows nothing about. This new culture had to be syncretistic. Syncretism is not only, as the dictionary says, the combination of different forms of belief or practice, such a combination must tolerate contradictions. Each of the original messages contains a silver of wisdom, and whenever they, see that they say different or incompatible things, it is only because all are alluding allegorically to the same primeval truth. You see, Echo wants to discredit traditionalism. It is, as he says, syncretism, as, and as necessary, possesses inherent contradictions. Whenever any, any unity is found in completely different religions, it is only because traditionalists believe they are just metaphors, and in such, can mean anything they wanted to. Rene Guanan, as I said, has a chapter on secretism where he says things like, 
Syncretism in its true sense is nothing more than a simple juxtaposition of elements of diverse provenance brought together from the outside, so to speak, without any principle of a more profound order to unite them. Obviously, such an aggregation cannot really constitute a doctrine any more than a heap of stones can make a building, and if it at some times gives the impression of doctrine to those who look at it superficially, this is an illusion that cannot stand up even under modest scrutiny. If only Echo could have read going on, they most likely would have come to agreement. You see, to traditionalists, syncretism is a mixed match of different superficial elements of cultures and practices and beliefs, whereas they attempt to synthesize or find unity not in the superficial elements, but the interior knowledge. They are similar only in as much as, much as they are inverted opposites, and this vague primeval truth that Echo and modernists like the jest rat is simply meta metaphysical knowledge on the nature of reality. It would be like saying Marx is a is the only one who knows the true mystical nature of capitalism, or that Hegel's dialectics is a primeval truth, and Hegelians looking back are simply reinterpreting this obscure knowledge revealed in the past, say as you will on whether or not traditionalists are correct. It's just bad faith to label them as quacks, they believe they know the obscure truth of reality and not the same for modern philosophers who attempt to find out the same thing, and are as obscure and esoteric as ancient doctrines, what's the difference except a modern bias? Not to mention that when Echo says the new culture had to be syncretistic as if this wasn't just blatantly opposed by the traditionalist school, I quote, traditional forms may be compared to paths that though they lead to the same goal are nonetheless distinct. One obviously cannot follow several at once, and once one has been taken, it ought to be followed without detour to its end, for passing from one to another is the surest way to impede one's progress, and even risk losing one's way completely. Rene went on against mixing traditional forms and perspectives on initiation. So what is it that Echo believes that traditionalists believe? He himself was either malicious and lying, or in incompetent in understanding the intellectual powerhouses that dwarfed him completely. Now maybe you believe that I'm wrong, as Echo is addressing Evola and fascism and not the traditional school, though he obviously makes vague remarks about it. So was Evola a syncretist? Here's a passage of Evola's revolt against the modern world in his foreword. The method that I use has as little in common with the eclecticism or comparative methodology of modern scholars as, as the method of parallaxes, which is used to determine the exact position of a star by references to how it appears in different places. Also, this method has as little in common with eclecticism to borrow an Im image of Guinan's as the multi multilingual person's choice of the language that offers the best expression of a given thought. As you see, Evola was a follower of Guinan and agreed with him, though they did have some disagreements. Now, Echo al also says, one has only to look at the syllabus of every fascist movement to find the major traditionalist thinkers. The Nazi gnosis was nourished by traditionalist, syncretistic, occult elements. Spooky, isn't it? Now, of course, this is also in reference to Evola and his relationship with Mussolini and the Italian fascism. I will go on later to show that his, his relationship with the fascist government and intellectual basis is and has always been way overblown than it really was. But also, is it true that the Nazi way of thinking was nourished by traditionalist elements? Funnily enough, Evola has a book on this titled Hitler and the Secret Societies, where he says, This thesis was first proposed in the well-known very far-fetched book by Powell and Berger, Le Montant d'un Magician, English edition The Dawn of Magic, in which National Socialism was defined as the union of magical thinking with technology. The expression he used was tank divisions plus René Guénon, a phrase that might well have caused the eminent representative of traditionalist thought and esoteric disciplines to turn indignantly in his grave. Though Evola does not say there was no influence at all, in fact, he says it was undeniable. But this was about myths, not quote-unquote magical elements, it should be also noted that I have not re read the book Evola is referencing, so I'm not sure on the accuracy, but on whether or not the Nazis were influenced by the occult and traditionalist thought, and not simply mythical thought, which as Evola quotes Sorel, motivating energy ideas, Evola disagrees. 
Similarly, no rational person thinks of magic in connection with the myths of fascism such as the myth of Rome or that of the Duce any more than those of the French Revolution or Communism. He also says, Likewise, some have spoken of unknown superiors who are supposed to have called forth the National Socialist Movement and to have used Hitler as a medium so it is unclear what goals they could have had in mind doing so. If one considers the result, the catastrophic consequences to which National Socialism led, even indirectly, those goals must have been obscure and destructive. It's funny that people will paint Evola as a conspiracy theorist, though they believe these things. But you don't have to take Evola's words on it. it this is a widely dispelled myth that, that the Nazis had some occult directives. It's literally just a conspiracy theory that Echo obviously buys into. And in disproving this, one might wonder what leg does Echo have to stand on in his 14 points when all of them are based on this idea that fascists and Nazis were studying the occult and secretistic faiths were at their center. It's clear that Echo as a child in the times of the fascist regime and growing into adolescence at the time of their downfall simply read the popular literature which Wikipedia describes as a sensationalistic and fanciful presentation of its figures and symbols shorn of all political and historical context and doing so, imagine that the Nazis were occultists and that occultism was at the center of fascism. I don't really want to go in on the 14 points of fascism and whether or not it's an accurate definition. In fact, Umberto Eco's definition is not a sociological definition, like Vosch believes, or a political science one. Umberto Eco's definition is a semiotic one, which is not to say it's wrong. I just want to say that Umberto Eco is not the authority on fascism. His definition isn't the only one, and in specific to Umberto Eco, his work should be viewed through a lens in semiotics and not anything else. And why should we believe him over Julius Evola, who had more experience with fascism? Well, it's because Vosch and other leftists, especially Vosch, who this video is about, well, to, will defer to Echo's 14 points as though religious scripture when pressed on a definition of fascism. We have heard so many contradictory definitions. Fascism is capitalism and decay. It's illiberal, the conclusion of liberalism. Nationalist totalitarianism. Monarchy is fascist. America is fascist, Trump is a fascist, Joe Biden is a mini fascist, the Soviet Union was fascist, why can it be the case that something may share elements with fascism, at least in a superficial form, but that those elements are not fascist in and of themselves? Umberto Eco's definition of fascism, which Vosch will undoubtedly claim as the reference he uses, is subpar, and most of its points are just too broad and of course irrelevant nor specific to fascism. It is also just viewing Echo's works through the, through the wrong lens. Nevertheless, arguing on whether or not Evola fits the bill would be pointless. As is said in Wikipedia, he argues that it is not possible to organize these into a coherent system, but that it, it is enough that one of them be present to allow fascism to coagulate around it. How could I argue that Evola, let alone anybody or anything, is not fascist according to these points when you simply need one of them to be so? What can fascism be when it refers to social phenomena that contains elements alien of, to official fascism but also based on historical fascism? Is fascism as a, a disease that infects somebody with a machismo mindset until they're advocating third positionism? Almost every political organization today appeals to a frustrated middle class. As you see, my opinion is not so much that Echo is not accurately defining something that does happen, that does happen, but it's whether or not what is happening is simply fascism and not just totalitarianism, which can be far right as well as far left. As for Evola, my opinion would be that he simply fits into two of these points, and that is the supposed cult of tradition and rejection of modernism. But not because I believe those things are fascist, but because I believe that Echo shoehorns those points in to include Evola, and a new phenomena, that being the neo-fascists that surrounded him. And in the case of the supposed cult of tradition, I, I believe I made my point clear. Echo had no idea what he was talking about. And on the historical activity of Julius Evola that Vosch references, Let's retreat back to Wikipedia and one of the citations 
an article from The Atlantic titled, The, Ale the Alt-Right's Intellectual Darling Hated Christianity. Evola wasn't an organic intellectual for the fascist government, but rather a merely tolerated one. Mussolini didn't like Evola because he knew of the magic rituals. For his part, Evola thought that Mussolini's fascism wasn't extreme enough, Calta Bologna noted. It should be noted that whenever leftists say that Evola believed fascism wasn't extreme or fascist enough, this is simply a way to make Evola into still a fascist. How could Evola be more fascist than the actual fascists, and what does that mean? Does that mean, like, millions of genocides instead of just the one? Like I said, Evola was not the ultimate fascist, but beyond fascism, further to the right than it. He was something entirely different. Add another citation simply titled Julius Evola by James Horrocks. Although he was close to Mussolini's regime, Evola's misgivings over Italian fascism were such that he never joined the fascist party, because he could not find his ideas reflected therein. However, in the 1930s he turned to National Socialism, which initially appeared to him more attractive insofar as it placed greater emphasis on the transcendent. Throughout the 1930s he lectured widely in Germany, closely monitored by the SS who kept a dossier on him in the Correspondence Administration Department of Himmler's personal staff. Ultimately, however, he concluded that here again it was not the transcendent state that stood as the primary reference point for the National Socialist variants of fascism, but the mob. And the Vosch's claim that Evola works for the SS is an overblown claim and exaggerates his influence within the SS. The same source says simply, in 1945, while in Vienna working as a researcher in the SS confiscated archives and documents of Freemasonry and assor assorted occult organizations. Um, it goes on to talk about how he uh, blew out his spine. However, Evola's relationship with the SS follows an even more interesting story. In the foreword of Men Among the Ruins by E. Christian Kopf, after noting that Evola was only tolerated by official fascism, the report summarized three of his lectures and concluded, The ultimate and secret motivation for Evola's theories and plans must be sought in revolution, revolt of the old aristocracy against today's world which is totally alienated from the upper class. This confirms the initial German impression that we are dealing with a reactionary Roman. Since Evola is only tolerated and barely supported by fascism, it is tactically not necessary to accommodate his tendencies from our side. A memo dated 8th August 1938 reports that Him Himmler himself has acknowledged the report regarding the lectures of Baron Evola and is in full agreement with the thoughts and recommendations stated in the paragraph thereof, which recommended ignoring Evola and discouraging his influence in Germany. And I find it hilarious that Walsh wants to call him a Nazi above anything else, when he was more hard on Nazism than anything in the world. To that I refer you to his notes on the Third Reich, where he bashes Nazism at every turn. And basically, Evola was far right the most furthest right wing you can go, probably, and Vosch himself says, Yeah, he thought Mussolini was too much of a liberal. And it, instead of this meaning that Evola was beyond fascism, Vosch and leftists would wish to believe that this meant that he was the ultimate fascist. When it's simply not the case, again, I refer you to his self-defense th statement where he goes over his beliefs and their incompatibility with fascism which I could go over, but that would extend this video out of proportion more than it may already be. But in summary, Evola was against totalitarianism, instead preferring an organic state. He was against fascist hierarchism. He was against Gentile's conception of the ethical state and rejected dictators and cults of personality and when fronted with corporatism, criticized fascist corporativism as a simple bureaucratic superstructure that maintained the class's dualism, and pointed out that um, corporatism was not specific to fascism, but was even a reference in the legal parties of his day. Like, like I said, Evola was far right, but far right does not mean fascist. If he was, I would have no disagreements. Evola certainly wasn't a liberal, nor held a left-wing critique of fascism, 
But this attempt to paint Evola as a magical fascist or whatever has always been used as a lie to discredit him. And it's simply that, a lie. And I think it's that paranoia that leads people towards ideas like this. Is that The Republican Party, however, is a death cult. They have no plans for the future of America, no desire to see us grow, no desire to see our economy or a demographic shift positively. The goal of the Republican Party is to inflict as much misery as possible on the groups of Americans and non-Americans they dislike the most. The predominant ideological trend behind the Republican Party is Christian fundamentalism, and Christian fundamentalists enact political action which they believe will bring about the rapture. They are not planning rationally for the world. It is a death cult. We live in a Lovecraftian novel, okay? And I will defend to my dying breath the idea that the Republican Party is the most dangerous organization on the planet. We are now at a point in this country where if you kill a member of a far-right militia, self-defense or not, we don't know because there was never a trial, you will be driven up on by unmarked vans and gunned down in front of your house while civilians sprint to flee the line of fire. And the President of the United States will laud what has taken place as a successful act of retribution. This was a hit. This was a hit on a political opponent. It could happen to any one of you. You realize that, right? If you are here, if you enjoy my content, you match a political profile that means that if you were to be killed by the state, your death would be celebrated by about half the country. As if calling Evola a fascist was not enough for Vosh, you must also attack him on some crazy personality traits that Vosh projects onto him. I don't know why Vosh says that he was... He was, I'm going to simplify this a bit, a deeply weak and paranoid man who, like many other men of his type, fantasized about building walls around himself, uh, both in a personal and social sense. I don't know where, Va where Vosh has gotten this information from. I also don't know why he says that Evola wanted to build walls around himself and as if that was a bad thing. I don't know if this is true. I can only see him saying as such because Evola did not write much about his own life and for some reason leftists love to use that as proof of him having a bad personal life as if wanting to keep your writings purely intellectual is a bad thing. I, I don't know how to prove how to disprove these absurd claims. I mean, Evola had friends and was in social circles. He says so in the past with Cinnabar and another book written by an alleged student of Evola, the Sufi of Rome, we get even more insight, insight on Evola's personal life. And Vosh is surprisingly not entirely wrong when saying he wanted to build walls. I mean, he is described by the authors withdrawn and, and immovable and showed no physical touch, very much unlike Italians. Uh, I am entirely unsure what Vosh meant by him wanting to build the walls. It's such a strange criticism. The, the same can be said when Vosh calls him deeply weak. And again, where is Vosh getting this information from and in what way was he deeply weak? Was it because at some point he contemplated suicide but was able to overcome that urge? Or when he walked through bombing raids or maybe the fact that Evola never denounced or renounce his beliefs, even when doing so would have benefited him more than not. Again, it's such a strange criticism. The same can be said about the accusation of paranoia. I don't know if Vosh says this because Evola himself believed himself to be persecuted by the fascist regime, which even critics of Evola accept to be true. What I what I can't say for certain is that Vosh just wants to conflate Evola with your standard run-of-the-mill all writer and conspiracist. Vosh knows that a lot of modern right-wingers are obsessed with male strength and conflate that with Evola and, of course, and cliché hypocrisy. It turns out they're secretly gay or actually very weak and not masculine. Modern low-hanging fruit right-wingers that Vosh is accustomed to believe in conspiracy theories and believe themselves to be persecuted because, unlike Vosh, they're paranoid. 
And so, because Evola was right wing, he must also be super paranoid, unlike Vosh. Trump wanted to build walls between Mexico and America. Trump is right wing, Evola is right wing. Guess what? Evola wanted to build personal walls. That was his wall fantasy. These are all just baseless personal insults that Vosh projects onto Evola. And, and so strange that he says that Evola's paranoia is what led to his beliefs, as if he was the progenitor of these ideas and did not learn them himself. Evola didn't create the Kaliuga myth, he learned it from going on. And Evola's, Evola may have made it popular with the right wing, sure, but it wasn't his creation like Spengler's Decline of the West, and it had nothing to do with paranoia or personal elements, at least not the kind that Vosh wants to trick himself into believing. Vosh says that Evola is often attributed or associated with the strong men to create good times meme. Evola unsurprisingly never said this. He did believe we were in the dark age, and this may include men becoming more, more weak, though Evola would most likely say that in this time, masculinity either becomes inverted or only a superficial material remnant of what it truly is. Evola also cites a passage from a Hindu text, the Vishnu Purana. Men will fix their desires upon riches, even though dishonestly acquired. Men of all degrees will conceit themselves to be equal with Brahmins. And by the way, does that maybe sound like a certain somebody? Maybe a man who is flying with lying and grifting to, to get rich? That considers himself an intellectual? I would also like to use this to segue into a different though related topic. That is, this idea that the far right simply appropriates Eastern imagery. He uses the swastika and Evola writing about Buddhism as an example. I also want to say how hilarious it is that Vosh compares that to 4chan posters posting futa and anime. Well, that's some big brained analysis right there, Vosh. Vosh is also just wrong. The Nazi appropriation of the swastika is a lot more complex than them trying to grab imagery from anywhere they can especially the East. Wikipedia, which Vosh loves, says that the earliest known swastika is from Ukraine, and that, I quote, other Iron Age attestations of the swastika can be associated with Indo-European cultures such as the Illyrians, Indo-Iranians, Celts, Greeks, Germanic peoples, and Slavs. In Sintashta's cultures, country of towns, ancient Indo-European settlements in southern Russia, it has been found a great concentration of some of the oldest swastika patterns. How hard is it to just Google stuff? The Nazis used the swastika because to them it represented the Indo-Aryan culture that they sought to identify with and revive. Of course, they got this all wrong, and it's funny that Vosh says this and references Evola. Evola himself has something to say about this phenomena in his book Recognitions. This degradation of symbols is for every attentive overview, an extremely significant and eloquent sign of the times. And in specific to the Nazis in the swastika, his notes on the Third Reich, we may wonder whether starting with Hitler himself there was a real understanding of the central symbol of National Socialism, the Hooked Cross or swastika. And later, when the Hooked Cross was chosen as the party symbol, Hitler and his associate, associates had absolutely no clue of notions like these. That's in reference, by the way, to how they used the swastika. Evola had a lot to say on this. There's a lot more. He goes all in. That's to say that Evola was not fond of groups like the Nazis using symbols like the swastika. I also want to say how offensive it is that when talking about Eastern philosophy, leftists simply try to cage it in there. There can be no universal aspect or relevance outside of the East. They simply belong to the East as if any ideas belong to a particular region. Leftists obviously don't know anything about Eastern thought. They themselves try to appropriate it. But I came across this thread in Vosh's subreddit where one of his viewers accurately calls him out on, on attributing the strong men good times meme to Evola. And there was a comment along the lines of how unfortunate it is that the far right perverts otherwise harmless Eastern religions. And it's so ironic because in this way of thinking, leftists are the ones who are perverting it. How can you call it simply harmless? 
It's clear that to Vosh and other leftists, because after all, they are modern Eurocentrist, that to them, Eastern thought is just simply neat and spiritual mumbo-jumbo, harmless, but otherwise inferior to the superior Western and European line of thought. It is something that is just a cultural aspect of the East, while the Western way of thinking is universal and based in reality. Eastern thought is just this beautiful and exotic poetry that stands in contrast with Western rationalism and empiricism, a way of thinking that Avola and Guinan and the traditionalist school criticize. You see, it is not simply that the fact that the West and the East are two equal cultures with two equal and different ways of thinking, but actually, the West is a deviation from the East. As Guinan puts it, the position of the West in relation to the East is that of a branch growing out of the trunk. I must say all this because it is a common accusation against Evola and anyone on the right who follows Evola that we are simply appropriating Eastern religions to fit our agenda. As if a man who studied religion and wrote on basically all religions is appropriating the East because he wrote a book on Buddhism. A common remark referencing the Kali Yuga is that it is believed to have existed for hundreds of thousands of years, not since liberalism, like Evola readers and such like to portray it. Yet, Evola and his teacher, Guanan, believed there are cycles within cycles. It didn't start with liberalism, but liberalism is another cycle within the Kali Yuga. Evola and Guanan do not appropriate Eastern religions, they simply explain the primordial truth that is more acutely present in the Eastern perspective and writings, but which floated within the West, like in the time of the Greeks. Plato admits his debt to Egypt. Does Plato appropriate Eastern thought? In regard to the Kali Yuga, it is not something that existed simply within India, but can be found in the works of Hesiod in his Four Ages. The idea of cycles and human spirituality distancing itself and degenerating can be found in many different religions and ways of thinking. Now, in specific reference to this meme of the Kali Yuga, this strong men create good times, what else can this be other than what I referenced before? A degradation of symbols that are a sign of the times. You see, unlike what cyclical development truly means, Believers of this meme believe that history is a two-dimensional struggle on the human plane of existence. Instead of something governed by metaphysical laws, it reduces everything to a material basis. The Kali Yuga no longer becomes an era where, a metaf where metaphysical knowledge is lost and man is reduced to matter, but simply a time of politics to be overcome in the next election. I mean, what else can be said other than the idea that the good times are are Anarcho-capitalism, the opposite of a traditionalist conception of the origin. This idea that the far right appropriates Eastern imagery and philosophy is a lie. The swastika wasn't something unique to the East, and the reason the Nazis used it was more complex and simple admiration of the exotic East. Evola and Guinan didn't, ap didn't appropriate Eastern thought so much as they saw traditional knowledge being more contained and present there. But the same can be said for Western religions, which, by the way, are themselves usually borrowed from the East. In fact, I would argue that Evola and Guinan don't appropriate Eastern thought. It's actually just that we so flagrantly disregard it as having no value, valuable insight and something only and simply cultural. And how stupid is it that Vosh's arguments that the far right appropriates Eastern imagery because Evola, a man who wrote on world religions, wrote a book on Buddhism, not to mention that this is comparable to him with 4 channels posting anime on Futa on a website dedicated to anime. And finally, concerning this, the strong men, good times, I mean, is not even an accurate depiction of the Kali Yuga, nor is Evola responsible for it. I think of all things, sexism might be the one thing you can get Evola on. According to the leftist perspective on sexism, Evola would undoubtedly be one. However, Vosh th still manages to get some things insanely wrong. They, they were like, he didn't think women were worse than men. He thought that women were different than men. Different in that they can't vote or participate in civic society outside of child rearing, but they're not worse. This is wrong in so many ways that I can only honestly believe it to be a lie. First off, Evola was anti-democratic. He was a monarchist. 
he didn't think anyone should vote. Second off, Evola hated civic society. I quote, The view I am referring to is closely associated to the humanitarian liberal beliefs that true civilization has nothing to do with that tragic necessity and useless carnage called war. That a true civilization's foundations are not the warrior, but the civic and social virtues inspired by the immortal principles, cultural and spirituality expressed in the world of thought, the sciences, and the arts. Chapter 9, Men Among the Ruins. He says some more on civic society and all things are negative. Evola did not favor the civic society. He saw it as inferior to the uh, warrior society and aristocracy. So why would you say something so on the face wrong? And third, on child rearing specifically, again, to Vosh's surprise, Evola did not view this idea that women are to be just mothers in a kind light. In fact, you could argue that Julius Evola hated child rearing completely. There's a chapter in Men Among the Ruins titled The Problem of Births, and just with that title, you could probably get an idea of what it's about. Here, here are some quotes. After these considerations of a political order, I will, make na I will now make some comments about the prejudices of a religious and bourgeois nature that shun birth control. The Catholic religion has embraced the biblical principle concerning the multiplication of the human species, but in ordinary life and in general. Wherever there are no ascetic vocations, it is extremely unreasonable to legitimize and sanctify sexual union and marriage only when they are aimed at procreation, declaring them to be sinful in every other instance. For practical purpose, what does this mean? Other than the religious perspective here approves and even encourages the most primitive and animalistic expression of an instinct. In another uh, addressing women, however, it is incomprehensible to endorse the, the use of women and sexuality only in terms of procreation, as this amounts to degrading every relation between the sexes to an animal level. And, for instance, there's meaningless bourgeois rhetoric about children, the cult of children, and the, the, and the desire to have children. In the great majority of cases, it is not true at all that children are desired and are the main reason why a man and women get married. I mean, come on, Vosh. Evola has a whole book, The Metaphysics of Sex, where he is against child rearing and the idea that women, marriage, and sex should only be used to produce children. It's literally in the first chapter. He was one of the fewest conservative people against child rearing. In the same chapter of The Problem of Births, he even criticized the fascist campaign for, reaper, for population growth. There is so much on Evola and this topic, it, it could be its own video. Nevertheless, Evola in no way, shape, or form thought that the only purpose of women was to be used for children. It is quite literally the opposite of this thought. Now in regard to whether or not Evola believes women were worse than men, or as Vosh puts it, subhuman, I honestly believe that this is not worth getting into, because to left is anything short of egalitarianism is sexist, or thinking women are worse than men. To left is people are completely equal, and such men and women are completely equal. However, they usually say this is not what they believe when it's demonstrated to be false. Julius Sevilla obviously did not believe in egalitarianism, and that men and women were equal. He in no way believed this. In fact, he was against being sex as secondary and trivial. He thought to be a man and woman was inward before outward. So to leftists, they would undoubtedly say that Evola was a sexist and, and viewed women as inferior to men. Even when, even when Evola makes it clear that he thinks that women and men can be superior or inferior to each other. But regardless, I suppose I may concede this point, at least when arguing in the frame that leftists have created. This topic would have to include much more than that is outside of the scope of this video. Nevertheless, I do still think it is it is bad faith to say that Evola viewed women as worse than men and women as subhuman. I think it's obvious that Vosh is getting this not from Evola's work, but from philosophy tube video about Steve Bannon that briefly speaks about Evola and puts his views on sex in the same way. Vosh just has to put his own twist on the idea. In conclusion, I have not attempted to cherry pick Evola for quotes that I like and, and that prove my case. But what I'm saying is quite literally what Evola believed, at least in a basic sense. You do not have to agree with them nor think that Evola was anything he, that he wasn't. He was far right. 
but that doesn't mean fascist. He was something entirely different, and his views are sometimes, if not all the time, incompatible with fascism. This is not to say he had more of a liberal view, but precisely the opposite. I think that it's clear that Vosh was lying. I, I don't know how anyone could say that he, wa that he wasn't. He could not talk about all of his beliefs, even if he read a couple pages. This isn't unique to Evola. Vosh has a history of saying he knows more about philosophy or philosophers than he truly does. It is clear, however, that Vosh has no idea what he's talking about on this subject, and many more 